No, you and you and Zach graduated about the same time. Oh, there it is. We're on Zoom. Hey, so I think we are live. Welcome everyone in the uh, Facebook space or metaverse, as I should say now, since uh, that's I think what it's called. But <clears throat> anyway, this is a live with a lawyer, uh, landlord uh, attorney edition. Um, hello to everyone out there who is happening to be watching this. Um, do some quick introductions real quick. Um, my name is John Seitz. I'm with the Yakima branch of Witherspoon Kelly. Uh, before our office was acquired, it was known as the uh, Lion Law Offices or Lion, Wigan, and Gepsison. But <clears throat> anyway, um, my background, I've been practicing law for well over a decade now, and a good chunk of that has been uh, practicing uh, landlord tenant law, uh, representing landlords um, uh, nearly exclusively, um, including um, uh, management companies and housing authorities. So I have background in not only landlord tenant law, but uh, public housing law as well. Um, <clears throat> And uh, I would say that up until about 2019, it was uh, pretty steady, pretty easy, not too difficult. Uh, and then 2019, things kind of started to change. And we had uh, COVID in there. And uh, then the big changes that came this summer with the 2021 legislative session uh, which is what we are here to touch upon today. So with that, I'll turn it over to my colleagues to have them introduce themselves. Um, uh, how about Stefan, do you wanna go next? I've lost Stefan for a bit. Uh, how about Zach? Uh, yeah, I'll step in here. Uh, greetings, anyone, everyone who, uh, who may be here. Um, it's January 25th, 2022. I'm not sure if we're catching everybody live, um, but if anyone's rolling in after, uh, just know that uh, this is when we're here today. Um, uh, just a little bit about my background, I guess. Um, I've been practicing law here in Yakima for about 10 years, a little bit over that. I'm celebrating my, my first decade. I agree a lot with uh, what Mr. Seitz had just said about um, it being a relatively easy area to practice in, in terms of landlord tenant work uh, for the last uh, at least the first part of my career, and that's changed significantly since uh, 2019 and, and the government's, uh, the governor's proclamations um, and, and moratoriums since then. Uh, obviously, what we're here today to talk about, it partially. Um, uh, I have a general civil practice here in town, though. Um, certainly, uh, I, I've done debtor creditor work, foreclosure work, bankruptcy stuff, uh, represent businesses and commercial contracts and all that kind of thing. But certainly landlord tenant law has been one area uh, as part of my practice that has seen the most change in the last couple of years. And so I think the reason I'm here today is, is just to provide kind of uh, my two cents uh, along with these other guys about maybe how you might start to change the way you're looking at the way that the landlord tenant laws work. Um, all of this stuff is not to say that you shouldn't go out and seek proper legal advice. Um, of course, every case is going to be different. And a lot of this legal stuff that we're going to be talking about today is, is still something that I'm even trying to uh, wrap my head around because there has been a significant amount of changes out there. And so I think um, I'm happy to be here today. And I, I thank uh, volunteer attorney services and Quinn Dallin particularly for, for inviting uh, myself and the other guys to uh, have this opportunity. Um, so if if that's enough of an introduction for me, I'm not sure if, uh, Stefan, are you uh, with us still at all? I think so. Um, sorry, my, uh, okay. my Zoom has decided to, uh, to go in a different direction than I would like it. So I'm, I may, I think I may be on and off visually, but I will try to try to stick on with the audio. So thanks for your patience, guys. Um, hello, my name is Stefan. Uh, I am the young guy, the new guy at Larson Berg and Perkins in Yakima. Um, it is a uh, four, uh, four member firm at the moment. And uh, we do everything from real estate 
transactions, uh, trusts, estate, probate work to um, general business litigation. And I happen to be on the litigation side, which means that um, when our landlord clients go to court, I uh, I'm there trying to help them uh, get what they need to get. And sometimes that's an eviction and sometimes it's a court order for people to do what the lease tells them to do. Um, I was uh, previously in Spokane uh, working for a court before I came out here, um, doing some research on the back end to assist judges. And uh, it's, uh, it's been a pleasure uh, to have been in Yakima and to work with uh, my esteemed colleagues, Zach and, and John, who are you know, a little bit more, a lot more experienced than me, but very gracious in their, in their interactions. So it's good to be a part of this community. Uh, thanks for in in introducing us, John. Great. So can we, do we want to bring up the PowerPoint or if that, uh, if that doesn't work, I, I can always free wheel off the cuff here as I've got a. <laughs> let me, let me bring it up. For, for the, for the high points, but. Um, yeah, let me, let me grab it. Let me pull up the zoom and I think I've got it here. Mm, hold on. Push the so while you're working on, while you're working on that, I'll, I'll just kind of generally say that. <clears throat> Um, to kind of understand the big picture. Well, here we go. Um, but the big picture is that uh, COVID came along in March of 2020, as everybody knows, and that really kind of uh, rocked the landlord tenant world um, with the um, initial proclamations that came out from the governor that really put a uh, really pumped the brakes and, and, and put a more or less a halt to um, uh, evictions. And so what happened in, in between, <clears throat> while that's going on in March, 2020, you have the state legislature behind the scenes um, working um, <clears throat> to, um, you know, really start address these address these issues. And that didn't, that really didn't complete itself through 2020. And it wasn't until um, earlier in 2021 that the legislature passed, uh, passed its laws that um, uh, ended, ended the moratorium, uh, allowed um, eviction cases to proceed forward, um, <clears throat> but really put in place, really changed the landscape of the law and, and created what um, we call for cause eviction. Um, whereas previously, um, most private landlords were familiar with the, <clears throat> the old regime where it was either, you know, you could terminate or evict somebody with a uh, pay or vacate notice or a uh, 10 day comply or vacate notice or a 20 day no cause, uh, any reason whatsoever uh, notice that just ended the tenancy. Well, all that changed with 2021 and, and uh, the law became uh, phenomenally more complex. Uh, folks like myself who had practiced, <clears throat> uh, practiced this work in terms of uh, representing housing authorities or uh, private landlords that received government subsidy, it, it wasn't as shocking because we've always had, uh, you know, previous to this, we've always had some form of for cause eviction. Um, there, there was no such thing as just a simple termination, uh, 20 day, any reason you, you had to have, uh, what we, what we called, um, uh, you know, either um, some material breaches of the um, lease agreement or other good cause uh, to terminate um, uh, rental agreement. <clears throat> but uh, so it wasn't entirely shocking to me, but uh, I think for a number of um, private landlords that, that weren't quite used to it, um, it, it's really changed the landscape. And so um, and then I forgot to mention, so the legislation passes, it becomes effective, <clears throat> uh, it becomes effective, it ends the, it ends the uh, 
moratorium, but we had these two intervening, what we called bridge proclamations uh, that really um, were kind of aimed at rent-based uh, rent based evictions. And so <clears throat> that's kind of the landscape. That's how we got to where we are. Uh, and I think we can now touch on some of the um, some of the high points um, uh, as uh, uh, Stefan has put them together in this uh, PowerPoint. All right. Um, so uh, this is kind of like John said, uh, I think we need to first uh, remind everybody like uh, Zach and John said, this is not legal advice. Um, the, you know, human beings are not computers. PowerPoints are not uh, substitutes for legal advice. So you really need to, if you have a specific legal question, um, one, don't share it with us on this chat uh, because there are rules that protect your confidentiality. So um, if you have a legal question, uh, contact a lawyer and um, have that chat in private. Uh, this slideshow does not cover every um, issue or every, even every change that occurs in the law this year. It's kind of a what to be aware of and what to look out for to help you kind of avoid issues that we see regularly um, and that come up. So it's not going to tell you everything you need to do, and it's not going to tell you um, all the things that can occur, but it's more like a, a kind of a general uh, guide, so to speak. Um, and most importantly, remember, uh, not legal advice. You need to work with a lawyer because um, the law has changed a lot, and it's a lot more complex. The, uh, the statutes um, are not super easy to parse. Um, and we encourage you to seek somebody who to seek advice and help from somebody who does the work often um, and can guide you through the process and if necessary uh, represent you in court. Hopefully, um, hopefully that doesn't come to that case and your problems can be resolved without a resort to the courts. Um, Zach, you had a really good way of discussing our self-help laws. Do you want to take this um, this uh, this section? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and, and just one thing I would I would uh, maybe dovetail on, on to the disclaimers that we have about this not being legal advice. Of course, this isn't legal advice. Um, and legal advice for landlords is something typically uh, you'll pay for. Um, in order for us to really do a good job, we're going to need to understand you, your case, that kind of thing. But I also thought that, you know, in, in talking about what this presentation is and is not, this isn't something to hang your hat on and walk into court and hand to a judge and say, listen, judge, I know that this is the law because they said it at this uh, Zoom meeting on Facebook. That courtroom doesn't work that way, and, and please do not do that. But there is going to be a lot of stuff that we talk about um, in this presentation that is new, and it's not just new to us as lawyers. We're, we're all relatively young lawyers. Um, but this is new to the entire industry um, and, and within the state of Washington. And so whether you're working with an existing lawyer or you're going to try to find one, I do think that this can be helpful um, to understand the lay of the land and how it's changed maybe from the old way of doing things um, because uh, lawyers themselves are, are really trying to get up to speed with this and, and trying to get our own heads wrapped around this um, it has been a, quite an ordeal. And we've spent a lot of time as lawyers meeting with not only ourselves, but also with lawyers who, who tend to represent more land or tenant side issues, um, as well as judges at the local court. And, and, you know, all of these professionals are trying to get together and try to figure out how the new regime of, of laws in the landlord tenant space is going to work. And so I would not only recommend you to, to go out and find a lawyer if, if you can, um, if, you, if you're finding yourself with any specific questions or specific issues that you need to deal with under, under this type of uh, context, but also make sure you know, share these things with your lawyer and make sure that your lawyer understands that, uh, that the world has changed. I would think most lawyers are going to find in Yakima County are stellar people and they're going to understand that, but this is a, an on the go constantly. It has been evolving at least for the last couple of years. We're finally now just getting to the, the place where um, some of this is starting to make sense and all come together as the Senate or as the state legislature has finally condensed it into one law, one set of laws. Um, but, but again, this is an ever evolving thing and this is in, for informational purposes only. Um, I'm certainly no, by no means an expert um, in any of this and none of us lawyers are at this point. None of us can tell us we are technically anyways, but um, so, you know, landlords beware. Um, one other thing I was going to say, just to kind of keep in mind, um, 
this is a landlord focused presentation. Um, certainly the tenants and, and part of the idea behind this, I think, is there's a lot of resources out there for tenants. I think the COVID-19 thing, um, obviously the, the governor's moratorium prevented evictions for a substantial amount of time over a year. Um, and there's a lot of concern that people getting evicted for whatever reason would potentially, you know, uh, contribute to the coronavirus pandemic, what have you. Um, regardless of how you believe or what you believe about all that kind of stuff and whether it was fair to landlords or not, one thing to understand is that a lot of the issues and a lot of the changes have, have gone to make the process of evicting people just more difficult than it was before. And there's a lot of protections out there for tenants um, that didn't exist out there before. And so from a landlord's perspective, a lot of these things that are more complicated, um, it's really important that you understand them because it was in, in many ways made more made it more complicated for landlords to, to do business um, insofar as there's additional hurdles in the way for landlords to uh, deal with tenants and how they deal with tenants and, and eviction proceedings have gotten more complicated. Tenants, um, and we'll get into all this, but as you'll see, there's a common theme where, you know, maybe I'm a skeptic, but many, uh, particularly landlords who might be watching this are maybe going to notice that a lot of the changes seem to be uh, against their, you know, best interest maybe. So, Keep that in mind, all the more reason to get a lawyer involved. Um, and, and I think as we go through this, you'll understand that more. On that point, get a lawyer involved if, if, if you need that help in court, but otherwise you're gonna go to court uh, by yourself if you're gonna do it legally. And the reason I say that is in Washington, this isn't new, this has always been the case. You cannot uh, uh, choose a, a self-help remedy, if you will. In other words, um, as a Washington landlord, you can't go in and change locks. Um, if Let me take a step back. There's no way to evict a tenant without going to the courthouse first. Um, and there's actually other steps in that process that you're gonna to need to take too, which we'll, we'll talk about in a little while. But ultimately, this isn't voluntary on the part of a landlord. These aren't suggestions. Uh, the case law and, and the statutes and every, every piece of law you're gonna find out there in Washington state has always been clear that landlords, don't have the right to just go out and self-help themselves and take back property like a repo person might, you know, go back and take back a car. Um, you're going to have to go through the court system. This is a, a no self-help uh, state. And so what we're talking about when we say you can't change the locks, you can't remove the tenant's belongings, um, and you can't enter the rented property without 48 hours notice in certain circumstances. Um, all of that is to say, you need to comply with the law and you need to go through the court process. And no matter what you do, if you try to, uh, you know, take the law into your own, own hands or try to, you know, take a vigilante approach, um, at, at least from a lawyer's perspective, we certainly can't be helpful to you in, in trying to pursue it that way. And if any lawyer is trying to tell you to do that, be careful um, mm -hmm. because there's seemingly substantial penalties and all that sort of stuff awaiting you if, if you go that route. And so as annoying as, some of these additional provisions are gonna feel maybe from a landlord's perspective. It is of the utmost importance always that you comply with the law here, just because particularly being a landlord, um, there, there are certain penalties that, you know, you almost think they're trying to get you, uh, the, the way the law reads anymore. And so uh, it's important to follow the law as best you can. When in doubt, contact a lawyer. And if that doesn't work, uh, your best option is probably to go to the courthouse and, and uh, you know, see what the judge can <laughs> can do for you there if you, if you can't find a lawyer otherwise. But um, no matter what, don't take the bait and try to take matters into your own hands or something like that. Um, if, if you have a tenant that is not willing to leave uh, voluntarily, then you, you really do need legal uh, advice. And short of that, you need to go through the legal process anyways. And so um, that was a long way to say no self-help remedies. Um, and uh, I don't know if we want to do the next slide, but I, I think I covered that unless someone else. Someone else yeah. Oh, thanks, Zach. Um, Zach, um, just to be clear, when we're talking about self-help, there is a difference. Uh, can everybody hear me all right? Yes. I okay. Um, thanks, guys. There is a difference between uh, self-help and self-representation. Absolutely. So um, when we say self-help, we're meaning, um, you know, you think of, you know, the, the domestic dispute, but landlord edition where, you know, a spouse comes home and all their stuff is on the side of the road. As a lawyer, Lord, you can't do that. That's what we mean with self-help. You can't do things that affect the property without a court order. You can go into court 
without a lawyer and ask the judge to issue an order yourself. That's self-representation. When we say self-help, we mean you can't change locks, you can't uh, remove belongings, and unless there's an emergency, you can't enter the property without 48 hours notice. So there's a difference between self-help and self-representation before a judge. Just wanna make that clear. All right, um, we've got a summary here of what's new in 2022. As you probably know, uh, the federal and state eviction moratoria uh, have ended. So we're not operating under emergency um, stays or bans on evictions anymore. You don't have to worry about what those said. What you do have to keep in mind also is that even though the federal and uh, the evic state eviction moratorium have ended, you can still get rent relief. And that means uh, COVID rent assistance from uh, different counties and uh, the county government and, from not and through nonprofits. So just because the eviction moratorium has ended doesn't mean that there's no way you can, um, the, the, the relief available because of the pandemic is not. Uh, there is a new requirement in the law that you have to negotiate um, in regards to getting repayment before you can start an eviction lawsuit. Um, tenants now have a right to a uh, court-appointed um, free attorney uh, if the tenant is a qualifying low-income individual. There are new limits on when you can end a lease. Um, that is kind of what Mr. Seitz, uh, John, and Zach we're talking about when they talk about a four cause eviction. And we'll, we'll get to that. All of these we're gonna to get to in a little bit more detail. And the last thing, that kind of big thing that really changed is also new limits on when and why you can evict a tenant. So those are kind of the new headline issues. There were a lot of changes. These are the ones that we see most often though. Um, rent relief in Yakima, it's still available. Uh, things to keep in mind are that the application needs to be submitted by the tenant. Landlords can't, you can't submit an application on your tenant's behalf, but you can provide contact information to a nonprofit that is accepting them and processing rent relief applications. You can give them your tenant's contact info. You can give that nonprofit your, um, your, your tenant's contact information. The tenant just has to be the one to submit and apply for relief. You will need a written copy of your lease or something that in writing states the terms of your lease. And you're gonna to need to provide information on what the fair market value is. You're also gonna to need to give some information on obviously what months the tenant still owes and how much the rent was for that month. Another thing to keep in mind is that it's called rent relief, but it also in some cases can include more than rent. So if your tenant is behind on utilities, uh, you can try to maybe get some help from these nonprofits and uh, county sponsored um, programs. So it's not just rent, you can get help. It is out there, it's an alternative to eviction. And it is. Uh, it means that if you can get this process going, you don't need a lawyer. You don't need a lawyer to get paid through these programs. Your tenant will get to stay in the house and you won't have to pay attorney's fees and you can get um, you know, your rent due. So this is a great option um, that definitely is worth exploring. Let me just uh, dovetail or jump in there real quick, uh, Stefan. So, of course. Um, one thing to consider, though, uh, if you are a landlord and you are looking to accept uh, rent relief, um, I've seen different versions of uh, contracts or agreements. So uh, the way this works is there will be an agency that administers the funds. And as part of that, you will have to sign some kind of agreement that indicates, you know, what the rent is, what rent is in arrears, uh, how much it is. Um, and uh, I've seen some of these agreements, at least at, in initial stages, uh, where there was uh, language within the agreement that the unwary landlord in signing it would maybe not have realized that they were uh, signing an accord and satisfaction. And they may not have been getting the full amount that they were entitled to uh, and or they may have been waiving uh, their ability to evict uh, tenants for um, other reasons uh, that would otherwise be lawful, but the way the language was worded in the particular contracts, um, <clears throat> uh, they, they were waiving essentially statutory remedies uh, or, or rights. Uh, and so um, I think it's, um, 
you know, it, it certainly, I, I think they're great programs. Um, and I don't know if the contracts have been cleaned up, but when they initially came out, they were, they were form agreements. Uh, I, I believe they were drafted large part by the Department of Commerce um, or, or another agency. Uh, and I don't know if that language ever got cleaned up or if some of those form agreements are still floating out there with other local agencies that are dispersing the funds. But uh, certainly if you're a landlord, I would, um, and you're thinking about accepting rental assistance, I would at a minimum, um, you know, suggest that you read that agreement very closely. Uh, and then if you have any questions about uh, language in the agreement about, you know, what you're accepting and what you will or will not be allowed to do, um, you know, a, a quick consultation with a, with a lawyer uh, could answer many of those questions. And, uh, and, you know, at least allow you to make a, a, an informed decision as to whether or not, uh, not to accept rental assistance and or if you do what you would be giving up um, in exchange for doing that potentially or negotiate the contract uh, the rental rental assistant uh, agreement uh, on your behalf and um uh, john that's a really great qualifier um the contracts that i have seen uh it was kind of the next bullet point is that um, one thing you do need to know is that uh you know if you take rental assistance you may and it, it depends on the contract so you need to read it but you may be giving up, like John said, the right to evict your tenant for what we call um, non-material breaches. And this is a little kind of contract uh, wonky language, but um, a material breach is a breach that is strikes at the core of the contract. The whole re it's, it's a main reason for the contract. It's really important to the contract. And if you don't follow that part of the contract, what's the point of the contract? That's kind of a way of thinking about a material breach. A non-material breach is something that does, it's kind of related, it may be in the contract, but it's not one of the reasons you went to the contract. And a lawyer will be able to help you determine whether if you do sign this agreement and you want to evict a tenant, but you're not sure if you have a material or a non-material breach, a lawyer can help break that down for you and potentially even explain the difference in better detail to you before by looking over your lease and going through the potential rent assistance contract with you before you sign it. So like John said, it's not a bad idea to ask questions before. Um, the other thing to keep in mind is John said something called accord and satisfaction. Uh, that is a legal term that we use to kind of describe when somebody is gonna give you less than what you're entitled to. So say John promises to sell me a buy, buy my bike for um, 40 bucks. And he says, you know what? I'll give you 20 now and 20 tomorrow. So I give him the bike. And the next day I show up at John's house and he says, you know, I don't have the full 20, but how about you just take 10 instead and we'll call it square. Think of it as that accord and satisfaction is you take less than you're entitled to. In this case, I'm getting $10 less, but we're calling it square. The accord is, okay, I'll take $10 less. The satisfaction is we're calling it square. And so when you, if you sign a rent agreement that basically a rent relief contract that says, you know what, you're, you're asking for $800 a month, which is what you normally pay. We'll give you $700 a month for all the, you know, for every month. You're taking a haircut on that of a hundred bucks a month. And the accord and satisfaction element of that is if you take that extra, that you take that money, you can't ask the tenant or anybody else for that extra, that hundred dollar difference. That's just money that you're not going to see and you can't get. So that's what John means when he says accord and satisfaction. And again, if you have questions about what that means or how that applies to you in a specific situation, it's a good idea to talk to a lawyer, but that's something to keep in mind um, when you're reading these contracts uh, to keep an eye out for. Uh, thanks for that, John. Um, the other important thing to know is that you, if you, you can't evict a tenant, or you can't get rent relief, um, at least through most programs, if the tenant's not in the unit. There are some exceptions. You can talk to the um, some grants out there where if the tenant leaves without applying or promises and you wait and you wait and you wait and then they just dip on you and do not, you know, never apply for rent assistance. In some cases, there are some programs that can give you rent assistance, but those are exceptions to the rule. So if you do the eviction, you can't get rent relief. It's one or the other. 
And one of those programs is through the Washington Department of Commerce. And so landlords can can go there and, and check for that. There is, a, you know, there's a program for landlord assistance. Um, <clears throat> uh, I can't remember what the last statistics are on it, but uh, you can get some relief if, if you have a tenant that, um, that bails out on you or something like that. But mm -hmm. uh, uh, my understanding and, and from what I've briefly looked at it, it's it's a fairly onerous um, process. Um, and, and there's a, a lot of documentation that, that needs to be provided to get relief through that program. But th those programs are out there. So it's, it's not a totally hopeless situation either. Um, the other change, and this is this is if you're, you're looking to do an eviction and now we're, we're we're into the phase where maybe you've tried some stuff and you can't get the tenant to voluntarily pay. You're thinking about maybe I need to start an eviction lawsuit. I need to go to court and get some help. Before you can go to court, you need to engage in negotiation. Um, this is a new requirement in the law and it's specific to Yakima County. Not every county requires this. So if you have maybe a rental property in Benton County or uh, Klickitat, the rules there might be different. But in Yakima County, our court requires that you engage in negotiation before you start an eviction. One requirement is set by the statute. One is set by the court. Um, this is the statute requirement. This is the one that our legislature passed and is written into law. Um, you have to offer a repayment plan for any back rent that occurred basically during the pandemic um, up to December 31, 2021. So... That's our hard date. Um, some lawyers representing tenants may make another argument, um, but the date that is my interpretation of the statute is December 31, 2021. Any rent that came due and is now still owed and hasn't been paid, unpaid rent prior to December 31, 2021, that has to, you have to give a repayment plan. The repayment plan has to basically say one third of the monthly month the monthly rent uh, per month, you can't ask for more than a third of the monthly rent per month in the repayment plan. And the tenant needs 14 days to respond. So um, if you've got a, a tenant who's two months behind on rent and rent is, um, let's say, I'm trying to think of a number that's easy to divide into three, 600 bucks a month. <laughs> um, I'm a lawyer, not a, not a scientist. Um, then, um, you know, you can only ask that tenant to pay an extra $200 a month under the repayment plan. There are some other requirements. These are just the bare minimum, but these are things to keep in mind when you're looking at what you need to do if you are going to go and offer a repayment plan by yourself and not get an attorney involved. Your lawyer will have a better understanding of all of those little details that a requirement has to meet. Um, so again, consult a lawyer if you have questions. And just to jump in there uh, so that we uh, <clears throat> don't get accused of putting out bad information, uh, <laughs> but I, the the wording of the statute is, is very, very vague in this, but um, uh, I think I would tell anybody, I, I wouldn't put a hard deadline of December 31st on it. Uh, I think the way the statute is written and this is the reason why as practicing this, I have literally have this at my fingertips each and every day because I don't, I don't uh, trust myself to even, uh, you know, remember the nuances and details and daily I consult this uh, to, you know, to double check. But uh, so a repayment plan uh, has to be offered for rent that's accrued either six months following the expiration of the moratorium. And that's where we come up with that December 31st date. And we were all kind of thinking that was going to be it. Uh, but they've got this little phrase in here, or the end of the public health emergency. And as far as I know, uh, we've not at least, you know, you know, we can all we can all sense the end of COVID. And we, I mean, we, we're, we're hoping it's there. But uh, uh, as far as I know, the actual public health emergency has not been declared over. And so, um, um, Rent repayment. Oh, see, and, and Stefan's a master at this, so he can just correct on the fly here. This is this is why we have Stefan with us. Yeah, because uh, he can do this. We can't. Uh, but uh, rent repayment plans. Uh, 
can and should be offered uh, in, in for the foreseeable future. I, I put it that way. Uh, <laughs> until until COVID is uh, uh, well in the rear view mirror. Anyway. <clears throat> All and right, let me that's nowhere in sight as far as I see. I mean, um, still, I think we hear the, the term pandemic and I've heard endemic recently. There's some hope out there that that could be the direction we're going. Remember who wrote this, though? Um, it was signed into law by Governor Jay Inslee. Um, I think that's a good indication that um, whenever the public health emergency is kind of the operative uh deadline here. And so I think to play it safe, um, if I was a lawyer, if I'm doing it for a client, what I'm probably going to do is tell a client, my own client, uh, he'd have to come talk to me, but I think the, the safe bet is to just offer a repayment plan for all previous periods in which rent is in arrears. That's the safest thing and the easiest thing to understand. Otherwise, you get into that nuanced argument of when did the public health emergency end and, and reasonable minds are going to differ even when that gets determined someday. And so um, I think the key is to understand that in seeking repayment for, for months that uh, tenants have missed, um, it's, it's really how much can you require them as part of a reasonable uh, uh, negotiation um, for it to be deemed legally reasonable. You need to make sure that the amount that they're going to be required to, to pay you back is no more, uh, is structured such that it's no more than increasing their rent by one third. So if, if as Stephen mentioned, or Stefan mentioned, um, if, if your monthly rent payment was $600 a month um, and they didn't pay for the last year or so, going forward, there's you're gonna be able to charge them no more than an additional $200 a month to catch up those arrears. And so in theory, if they missed a year, it could take up to three years um, for that monthly uh, rent repayment plan um, to, to see that you're repaid in full. And, and just so everyone's clear, that is the, the minimum uh, uh, that you need to offer a tenant in terms of repayment. Um, you can certainly be more generous than that and offer them an even longer term to repay. And in certain circumstances, that may make sense, um, particularly if you have a long-term tenant or something like that, uh, that, that you, know, you, you otherwise look out for, that kind of thing. But uh, just to understand that the, the minimum is, is or the maximum that you can require that tenant to pay is no more than one third of whatever the monthly rent is going forward as an additional amount to repay their arrears. And so hopefully I didn't confuse that too much, but uh, uh, go on. Uh, and it looks like uh, we got the next point up there, um, which is about the 14 days, uh, Stefan or- uh, Yeah, Jonathan. let me see if I can get out of this annotation thing. All right. <laughs> Oh, sorry, we're a little stuck here. Oh, now it's, now it's, all right, there we go. Um, in Yakima County, you also need to, and this is the difference between the, what the statute says, the written law and the judge ordered law. Basically different courts have different rules. And in Yakima County, you have to participate in mediation before you can go uh, file an eviction lawsuit. And my understanding is, and maybe John, you can help me on this one if you recall, but the, if you go to the courthouse and you turn in a, uh, a complaint, which starts a lawsuit, if you don't have a certificate of mediation from the dispute resolution center, the clerk won't actually even take your money or your complaint. You can't, they won't accept the paperwork to start the lawsuit. So you are going to need a mediation certificate before you can get the lawsuit filed and moving. And that needs to be done or should be done through the dispute resolution center of Yakima and Kittitas. Kittitas counties. Correct. Right. There, there's an entire process for it. Um, and, and there's another form notice that goes along with it. And it, it comes from the legal requirement that every, every county had to establish uh, an eviction resolution pilot program. And, and those were coordinated through dispute resolution centers situated in each county. And so uh, locally here, we've worked out those procedures. Um, and there is a form notice uh, that has to be filled out correctly. And um, again, it, it's relatively simple, but it's easy to mess up. And so <laughs> any of this stuff, whether it, whether it involves a putting together a repayment plan or filling out the form ERPP notice, 
or uh, uh, filling out a 14-day pay or vacate notice. Uh, there are forms out there. Uh, Google's a great place for information. Uh, it's not a substitute for an attorney's license to practice law. Uh, so, you know, take the information as you will that's out there, but um, really encourage people to um, work with legal counsel if, um, unless you're, unless you're adroit at it uh, and have done it before and are familiar with all of this stuff, but um, <clears throat> trying to do, uh, trying to go through these processes like the pre-eviction negotiation or, or getting notices out correctly or putting together uh, the pay or vacate notices, um, doing that on your own is, um, well, <laughs> I, 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 I'll, I'll refrain from, from that, but um, uh, do encourage people to work with counsel because the risk is, this is the risk. If you do it wrong, you're gonna have to go back and do it all over again. And uh, a rent-based eviction, uh, you're probably looking at a, at a minimum of about 30 days because the dispute resolution center has up to 30 days to issue this certificate that you need, which is your key to the courthouse. Um, <clears throat> if you don't have that, you're not, you're not getting in. Um, you don't have to, you don't necessarily have to go through a whole mediation process in, in, in terms of the, in terms of the way that we think of it as, as lawyers in terms of what mediation means, but you do have to participate. And so, um, that involves being engaged with the DRC and, and going through their processes. And if you get to a resolution, that's great. And if you don't, then they'll give you the certificate or if the tenant doesn't participate, then they'll give you the certificate. But um, even getting to that stage uh, involves uh, a significant amount of notice and, and things kind of have to be put together the right way. Uh, <clears throat> and so um, it's- And uh, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, John Stefan, but it's, it is a free process, uh, the, the mediation process. It is a potential delay on the way to an eviction if you have your heart set that way. But um, on the other hand, uh, you know, it is free and mediation in typical context, you know, at least as lawyers, it oftentimes isn't. But um, it is a free opportunity to meet with the, a mediator who kind of does shuttle diplomacy between you and the tenant. And maybe sometimes a lot of cases can be resolved that way and, and short of more expensive uh, processes like an eviction lawsuit. Um, so it, it is something that, you know, uh, mediation was never required before. Um, this is definitely a, a new thing uh, to evict a tenant. You are required uh, to first, before you go to court, go to that mediation. Um, and, and just so as lawyers, mediation is a common, commonly recommended thing to all of our clients, I think. Um, in litigation cases, lawsuits, uh, where the parties just don't see eye to eye. Um, and what the mediation process is, for those of you who may not have heard that term before, um, it, it's basically, a, a, in this case, a pre-court process, but it's a process that takes place completely outside of the courts. Um, and it usually involves a, a third party, uh, I want to say diplomat, but uh, someone who's going to be a mediator, or someone who's going to try to kind of talk to one side, talk to the other side and bring people together. Um, if they can. And so uh, the point of all this is, is to make sure that you and the tenant have exhausted all other possibilities. And another big part of it is to make sure that you've actually offered a reasonable repayment plan. And so going back to the terms of what would be considered a reasonable repayment plan, um, the mediation process, if, if you haven't offered one before then, um, in many cases, that might be a way to make sure that you've offered a, a reasonable repayment plan before uh, you make the mistake of going into the courthouse without having done so. And I just put this all in context too. What, what we're talking about here in terms of pre-eviction negotiation, we're talking about rent-based, uh, where landlords and tenant have a rent-based monetary uh, obligation um, owing uh, situation. So some, you know, tenant has not paid, paid rent for a period of time uh, during the, you know, while this is in place, this is the, you have to go through this pre-eviction um, uh, resolution program uh, 
which is designed to, or the idea behind it is to uh, work through some of these issues, um, let's see if a repayment plan can be reached, or in some instances, get both the landlord and the tenant in contact uh, or working with, um, uh, to get uh, rental assistance. So sometimes it's just, there's some disconnect where for whatever reason, uh, tenants may not get, uh, get turned on to the rental assistance that's available to them or there's miscommunication between the rental assistance agency and the landlord. And so that's what this resolution pro process is, is aimed at, is to figure out what the issues are um, and and go from there <clears throat> and, and see if a resolution can't be reached short of having to go through a uh, eviction process. Um, think of it as, uh, as John pointed out, it's really only for rent-based stuff. So your mnemonic device is um, your little uh, mental side trick is if it's about money, you got to mediate. Um, so mediation for money is the, uh, the mind trick on that. All right, let's see if I have the ability to clear this out. Now clear all drawings. All right, there we go. Okay, next, um, this is another new and important uh, change and it is the right to counsel. Um, you probably are familiar with uh, Law and Order or other cop shows, you know, when somebody, uh, you know, they, they catch a suspect, they got the handcuffs on, they say you have the right to an attorney. Um, that's always been the case, or not always, but for our lifetime, at least my lifetime, and probably John's and Zach's too. Um, you know, in criminal cases, you had the right to a lawyer if you couldn't afford one. In Washington state now, Normally, that's not the case for civil lawsuits like eviction. Now in Washington state, because of these new laws, low-income tenants have the right to be represented in court by a lawyer. So low-income tenants now have the right to get free legal help from a lawyer if they qualify. And there's rules in the statutes. You don't need to worry about that as a landlord. What you should know is that if you choose to go the, the self-representation route and try to do the court process yourself, if you're working with a low income tenant, for example, who receives disability benefits or other kinds of uh, food stamps or similar programs, um, they are entitled by law to an attorney. So you will be working with, um, if, if you're trying to do an eviction against one of those tenants, there will be an attorney on the other side, most likely. Um, or there's a strong likelihood that there will be a lawyer on the other side, which is all the more reason why you should be careful in what you do and make sure you follow the law carefully and why the advice of a lawyer early on can be helpful. It's not just because we like, um, we like people calling us for help, it's because we want to make sure you do it right the first time. And if you don't do it right, there will be another lawyer likely on the other side who will uh, point that out and uh, make sure the court is aware of that. That could prevent you from getting the help you need from the judge. And by help order is what we mean, the court order you need from the judge. Um, judges can't give legal advice. Neither can court staff. So um, that's something else to keep in mind. Uh, there, if you've been in the past, if you've been using an old, um, if you've done a, a, a lawsuit yourself to get an eviction, if you've gone to court yourself, stood up in front of the judge and um, done an eviction lawsuit before 2021, um, you may have used a summons to start a court case. Um, it's a piece of paper with text on it that tells a, tells a tenant who is being sued in an eviction lawsuit, hey, you're getting sued, you need to come to court, here's how you um, deal with this court case, here's what you need to do in this court case. Um, if you have a summons that you used before 2021, or even before May or April of 2021, you need a new summons. And the statute, to, the statute that contains the text of the new summons is uh, right here, it's 59, uh, dot 18.365 subsection three. Um, so you got to make sure you're using the right summons and it'll say you got to use this form of summons and it'll have that information on right to counsel in there. So that's why it's in this section. Um, I so just quickly jump in and say, so, you know, the law is very strict in terms of what, uh, the process that a that a landlord has to go through to start an eviction case, and and if you do not use the right, if your forms and your pleadings or your court papers don't have the 
nearly the exact precise language that's prescribed by the law, that's grounds for, for a court to say, you haven't, you haven't followed what's required and, and your case will be dismissed and you got to go back and start it over again. And so <clears throat> uh, some of these changes that, that happen are, are very nuanced. Um, and so um, again, it's, 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 there really is no substitute for um, consulting with the lawyer, uh, you know, getting your lawyers, uh, you know, it, I mean, it, you know, it's maybe 15, 20, 30 minutes of time for your lawyer to review something and, and, and say, okay, yes, this is good or no, that isn't, mm -hmm. or this is what you need to do, or this is how you need to fill it out. Yeah. Uh, but that can save you, that can save you lots of time and, and thousands of dollars in down the road uh, if you, if you've done it wrong. And, and that's, that's the, that's the issue that, you know, we as lawyers see with, um, you know, information that circulates on the internet. I, I have any number of people that come in and bring me things and say, well, here, I, I filled out this form or I, I served this notice and I say, where did you get this? Well, I got it off the internet or, or the bookstore or, or wherever. And, you know, and I, I look down in the I look down on the document and it says 2019 down at the bottom of the document. It's, it's a clear tip to me that this is out of date. This, this isn't going to, this isn't going to work. Um, and then I have to, you know, deliver the bad news. Like, okay, we can fix this, but it means starting the whole process over again. And so um, do be careful. I, as I said, I, I think the internet's a great place for general information and to get an idea of how things work and, and, and what you're up against. Um, and uh, the processes, general overview of the processes, but it really is no substitute for uh, actual legal advice. Um, I would, uh, so yeah, yeah I'll just no. that as a copy off. <clears throat> and and if, to kind of sub segue off what John says, um, if you're using a form lease that you've used over and over again for maybe four, five, 10, 15, 20 years, and that lease has an attorney fee um, provision in there, if that lease says, you know, if we have to go to court and start a lawsuit, the party that wins at court gets attorney's fees for winning, um, and you have to pay the, the winning side's attorney's fees. If you go to court and you, um, and you lose because you didn't follow the right process, and you have an attorney fee provision in the lease, you could end up paying for your tenant's lawyer's costs. You could pay the lawyer fees for your tenant in some cases. So, you know, it's not just you lose the money and the time that you spent to prepare a, um, to get the lawsuit going and the filing fee to open the lawsuit with the court. If you didn't do the right things and the other lawyer points out that you made a mistake and the court says, yes, you didn't follow the process. You have to start over. We're dismissing the case. The tenant wins this case. You could have to pay the tenant's attorney's fees. And I've seen it happen. And, uh, you know, it's not, it's not a fun day. Um, you're basically paying your tenant to beat you. So don't, you know, there are real monetary consequences you could be facing if you opt not to seek a lawyer's help and make a mistake that causes you to lose the case. So John, you know, John stresses it a lot. And that's one of the reasons why it's important to pay attention to those details. And if you have any questions, um, or even if you don't have questions, have a second set of lawyer's eyes to look over it to help you um, make sure you're dotting all those I's and crossing all those T's. Um, I know that you may feel a little, um, it may be frustrating to have uh, a tenant who has a lawyer. Um, you know, there's a, there's a negative connotation to quote unquote lawyering up. Uh, but uh, in, in some ways, it's good. Um, keep in mind that uh, lawyers, you know, John, Zach, and I, we work with other attorneys um, in the bar, some of them who represent tenants all the time, and we have good lines of communication. Um, we do negotiation. We discuss how to resolve, to solve problems uh, every day for a living for all of our clients. Um, it's our job. So it helps in having a lawyer can help smooth the, the process over by giving um, giving you and your attorney uh, somebody who you can talk to consistently. And it also gives your tenant someone who they can trust and rely on in some cases, instead of having to make decisions on their own, they can get good advice from someone else 
who is experienced with the process. So it's not a bad thing that tenants will now have lawyers. In some cases, it can help smooth out the process. Um, maybe not all, but in some, there are some upsides. Uh, ending time limited leases. Now, this is one where we're going to have to be a little careful because this is one of the more complicated, um, complicated parts of the law. And when Zach and John talked about there being um, um, what we call an end to the no reason for cause, um, an end to the no reason eviction for any reason, we're talking about um, the new for cause law. Uh, I don't know if anybody's ever heard the, uh, seen The Office um, or that episode of The Office where Michael is trying to fire somebody he doesn't like. And uh, he's talking with the HR person. He says, you know, are you sure we, Michael Scott asked the HR person, are you sure we can't fire him? And the HR person says, not without cause, Michael. And Michael Scott's response is, I have cause. It's because I hate him. Um, in, in Washington, you used to be able to get away with a, a, that kind of not really a cause cause. Any reason you wanted to end a month to month lease, you could by giving the right notice. Now you need a for cause. We have an HR person basically telling us you need a, a reason to evict somebody. And more importantly, it has to be one of the reasons outlined, specifically mentioned in the new for cause law. Now we're not gonna talk about all of them here, but these are some of the, the bases that come up the most often. If you have questions, again, consult with a lawyer or read the statute, but definitely the best way thing to do is to talk to a lawyer. Um, Keep in mind that all leases now automatically convert to month to month. It doesn't matter if your lease because an automatic month uh, um, has a clause in it that says after this lease expires, it's to month to month or doesn't have that in it. Um, by law, once a lease ends, it automatically becomes a month to month lease. And that's important because once you get to month to, once a lease becomes a month to month lease, you can't, you have to have a reason to end the, uh, the tenancy to basically say, you need to leave and I don't want you in there anymore. Um, Special reason, uh, a delineated reason within the statute. Yeah, one of the reasons listed in the statute. Him, yeah, it, it, because I hate him isn't gonna fly. Um, the new rules prevent, um, there are new rules on how to prevent your lease from automatically, say you don't want your lease to become a month to month lease. Uh, the new, there are new rules on how you have to do that and you have to follow those rules. And once your lease converts to month to month, again, you can only end that lease for the reasons listed in the statute. We call it the four cost statute, but it's listed as RCW 59.18.650. I'll leave that on the screen for a second um, so that if you want to look at it, you can Google it, you can scribble it down. It's not a very clear statute. It's a little hard to understand. So strongly like John and Zach have been encouraging you to, if you are trying to end a lease that is month to month, talk to a lawyer. Your lawyer can help you understand the statutory language. They can look at your lease and they can help you navigate a path to see whether or not you can evict your tenant. And if you can, what you need to do to make that eviction happen and stand up in court. Are there right, any- Just to, or go on Stefan. I'd... Oh no, go ahead, Zach. I was just gonna uh, say, anybody else wanna add? I was gonna say, uh... This is a, I think you said this is a little bit difficult. I'd go one step further and say it's a lot of bit difficult, even, even for lawyers to wrap their heads around um, some of these new month to month uh, lease changes. And I think um, just to try to create some scenarios, maybe where if you're a landlord watching this, whether today or in the future or something like that, where you really need to be cognizant of, of this type of thing is when maybe you're dealing with a new tenant and when you're arranging new leases. Um, if, if, if you have a, a property that you're leasing, um, of course, there's different types of landlords. There's uh, landlords that have big apartment buildings that are going to perpetually stand and, and lease out apartments for a long time. But there's a lot of other landlords, particularly here in central Washington, Yakima County, uh, what have you, that they're just leasing out a, a house, uh, for instance. Uh, it's maybe an extra residence that they inherited or that they you know, moved into a better house and are renting their old house, whatever. Um, at the outset of setting those leases, one of the things that you need to take into account is what's your long-term view of this property? 
Um, and if it's a situation where you just want to rent it for a year, but then you want to get it back because you want to be able to sell it, maybe when the real estate market's doing better or something like that, um, that's where this type of, you know, all leases automatically turn into month to month leases um, really is going to matter because the, the risk that I think landlords need to be aware of is that if you sign a lease, so back in the old days, you used to be able to just sign a lease for a year and maybe the rent was a thousand bucks a month. Um, and a year would go by, the tenant's a good person, uh, you like that they're out there, you decide not to write a new lease, instead you just let the lease carry over. That was the way we used to do things, but now, uh, and carry over month to month, and as long as they keep paying their monthly thing, then everyone's happy, right? Mm -hmm. What has changed is, if you allow that initial lease term to expire, um, and then the, the tenant is continuing there and just paying their month to month rent, it becomes a lot more difficult potentially to take the property back if you decided that renting is just not for you anymore. Um, once the tenant has has stayed over, uh, what used to be called a holdover tenant, um, you know, stays over from a past that maybe the the lease's original term was one year and they stay that year, but then continue staying month to month and paying you. Uh, it becomes a lot more difficult to to get them out, and you don't have the right to pull the rug out from under them and say, hey, I only leased this for you for 12 months. Um, you know, now it's been 15 months and I want the property back. They're going to say, what, what, what? At the end of 12 months, it automatically became a month to month lease. And there's a, only certain reasons once the, the lease is created, uh, once it's crossed over into month to month past the original term um, that you can evict someone. And as you know, perfect antidote, it's not just because you hate them. It's not even necessarily just because you want the property back because real estate prices are high and you want to sell the property while well, you still can. Um, you can run into situations, potentially, a lot of this is untested too, but you can run into situations where the tenant says, you know what, I'm on a month to month lease and so long as I pay the rent um, and so long as I don't break any of the, uh, you know, the provisions in the lease, it doesn't matter that it was only for 12 months. I can stay here as long as I want unless you've taken some step to, to make sure that you prevented it from becoming a month to month lease. Um, and there's very specific, very specific ways that you have to go about doing that, including 60 day notice before the original lease term expires, um, those types of things. Um, and then there's a lot of specificity that we just can't reliably you know, communicate through, through Zoom and, and expect you to retain any of that. But I would look very carefully if someone is doing this by themselves, including signing a new lease going into the future, um, particularly if you get some of your units back, um, you know, after all this time, you need to look at your leases going forward and make sure that you understand or speak with an attorney about um, leases automatically turning month to month and what that could mean in terms of hampering your right to take the property back in the future, even if that initial lease term expires. Um, and RCW 5918.650, um, if, if you can read that and make sense of it, then you should probably call me and, and maybe, you know, I'll have a job for you at some point. Uh, not necessarily hiring right now or anything, that's a joke, but I, it's, it's one that I'm sure, like uh, John Seiss had mentioned, um, it's going to be, most attorneys are going to have to have that at hand to read and reread many, many times before it becomes back the envelope stuff, just because it's, it, or, you know, um, just because it's that complicated. Um, so, the, the, the buyer beware, the landlord beware here is when you have a desire to not just lease something potentially perpetually, so long as the, the tenant's great and all that kind of thing, you really need to be careful about your lease terms and make sure that you are honoring those. Even if you want a tenant to stay in there, um, situations are going to come like that where maybe you do have a tenant that you want to keep in there for more than a year. Most people, when they move into an apartment, might live there for a few years, a couple of years, the rest of their life, who knows? But you're going to have to be very faithful to the terms and leases and make sure you stay on top of that. Because if you don't, uh, you're going to run into a situation where the laws almost, to, to state it perhaps ineloquently and, and maybe not even technically uh, perfect, it essentially becomes a situation where the, the, the tenant themselves is allowed to stay there more or less as long as they want, um, as long as they, they keep the rent paid. And, and that could be something that if, if you're not on top of it from the very beginning, you could come to regret in the long run. So again, very important. And it's very important that you're considering this type of thing, particularly at the outset of, of signing a new lease. And so if, kind of to, to John's point too, if, if you got a lease that has at the bottom of the date, copyright 2019 or something like that, um, it's a really good 
uh, time to, to figure out if those leases are going to work for you going forward in the context of this type of rule change. Um, and, um, and kind of to pivot off Zach, if, if cost is a concern for you, I know people are always concerned about how much, you know, an attorney is going to run them to bill it. Uh, it, it is, it, this is, um, my parents used to have a saying, and I'm not sure if it's, it's commonly known, uh, a, a half an ounce of prevention is better than a pound of cure. Um, go have a real more, more affordable than having someone like John or Zach or I go into court and argue about what the contract means and whether you fit into an exception. It's way cheaper to go ask um, John or Zach or I or our colleagues to look over your lease and to help you develop a plan for how to manage your leases. You know, the kind of thing that we can do is we can say, this is the category your lease falls into. Maybe you're doing a lease that's too short to qualify for an exception. Okay, let's bump it a couple months so it falls within that exceptions requirements. And then here's when you need to send out this kind of notice. Here's what you need to, that's the kind of thing we can do to help prevent you from having problems um, early on. And it's way cheaper for us to give you that advice before you have a problem than it is for us to um, try to solve a problem after it's occurred. Um, so uh, that's called a lease review. And it's a great way to kind of get a primer on what the law is, how it applies to your specific lease and what you can do to um, make sure your lease is up to date with the current laws. Um, and uh, it, you can call any attorney who does um, contracts or leases and they can tell you what their rates would be for that. Um, now we're to the meat of this. And again, there are lots of reasons in the statute why you can evict. It's a long statute. We're only covering a couple and these are not, this is not all of the requirements. It's just categories. Think of it as a broad overview of a few reasons. They're not going to tell you what the specific reasons are. You need to talk to a lawyer or you need to read the statute if you want that kind of advice. But again, the best way to understand this law is to talk to a lawyer who has worked with it, who, like John, has it as an elbow at his elbow and uh, can flip it open and look at your lease, listen to your story and the facts, and apply the letter of the law in that packet he held up to your specific case and give you advice on what you specifically should do. Nothing that we tell you in this PowerPoint is gonna be detailed enough or specific enough for you to rely on and to do yourself. Go see a lawyer if you have questions. Think of this as what kind of things you should ask your lawyer for when you talk to them. Um, so maybe you go in and you're not going in blind. Hey, I heard that this might be an option. Can you tell me about this, um, Mr. Seitz, Mr. Hummer? Um, and they're great people. They're very smart and they'd be happy to help you. Um, so again, all month to month leases can now only be ended for the specific reasons listed in RCW 59.18.650. We've talked about that. You know that we've hit you over the head with it. The ones that I am seeing most often, and I think Zach and John are also seeing most often are non-payment of rent. Um, again, we're, uh, you know, you, somebody's not paying the rent and you got to get a tenant in who is going to pay the rent. Um, this is a one that I'm seeing a little bit more often, uh, but it's basically if somebody breaks the lease, breaks the rules of the lease, say you have a no pet clause in your lease and they bring in a German shepherd um, and, you know, you're maybe it's a small apartment or a duplex and the German shepherd's running, running rampant in the backyard and scaring the neighbor's kids. Um, you know, that would be a violation of the rules or the lease other than paying rent late. So paying rent, late rent is a separate category. Every other set of rule in the lease is um, what we would call an unremedied violation of the lease. So basically in that situation, you've told the tenant, get, uh, in this example, get rid of the dog by this date. And if you don't, and if you don't get rid of the dog, um, your lease is no longer in effect. You've broken the contract and you're gonna have to move out. Um, if they don't get rid of the dog and they don't move out in this example, that is an unremedied an unfixed violation of the rules, and it's a basis for cause. Now, this is a little bit weird because um, it may or may not be listed in RCW 59.18.650, um, but it is a reason that you can cancel a lease and you should talk to your lawyer to determine whether the, the rule that is broken is a good reason to uh, terminate the, the lease and whether you told the tenant in the right way that they need to fix the lease. There's certain, you have to, 
you have to do it in writing, you have to give them so much information, your lawyer will make sure that you gave them all the information they need to fix their um, violation of the rules. And again, that's why it's a good idea to talk to a lawyer early. They can walk you through that process to make sure you're doing it right. Um, if your tenant does fix the violation of the rules, but they keep breaking the rules over and over and over again. Um, in that case, if you have more than four violations of the rules uh, in a 12 month period, and you've given them the right kind of notices, um, you've given them written notices, and every time they've fixed it by the deadline, the fixed deadline, but they just keep breaking the rules again and again, if there are more than four violations that you've documented and you followed the procedure, outlined in the statute. Again, this is not everything that the statute requires you to do. So you need to talk to a lawyer to make sure that you're giving them all the information the statute requires them to. But if you've given the right notice and your lawyer has helped you make sure that you've provided them with the right deadlines and the right information and it's all in writing in the right way, then you can decline to renew um, with 60 days notice. So basically if you're in a month to month lease, you can refuse to um, tell them, hey, in 60 days, your lease is going to end. The next, two month, the next two months are going to be the last month. After that, you need, to, you need to find a new place to live. That is one reason. Again, there are very specific things you have to do to qualify for that four violation exception. You need to follow them specifically. If you do not follow them specifically, you will get your case dismissed, most likely. And um, you could be liable for the other side's attorney's fees. So for your tenant's lawyer fees. So talk to a lawyer if you think that you might qualify or you have a tenant who keeps breaking the rules, your lawyer will help you fix the problem and document it in the right way, in the right methods. So see a lawyer if this specifically, especially for this one, if you think this is a problem. Uh, Zach or John, do you have any thoughts on, on those most common? Yeah, I, I would just say, and I think you, just hit upon a, a, a key issue is that <clears throat> it really is a process now. Uh, whereas, you know, pre, you know, pre 2019 or even pre 2021, um, the ability to evict for no cause uh, really didn't require very sophisticated forms or notices. Uh, so if you had, for example, a month to month uh, rental agreement, um, <clears throat> and you wanted to give 20 days notice, I, I mean, that form was, you know, about, about, about a paragraph that said, you know, your tenancy is going to end on this date, you need to vacate. Uh, that is not the case now. And there is um, one of the changes in the laws said that uh, notices for any reason uh, that you're going to any cause that you have, um, for ending a tenancy, the notices have to be drafted with specificity. Uh, again, that's based upon my practice. That wasn't necessarily a, a, a shock or new to me because that's always been a requirement under federal housing and subsidies uh, of various federal programs that, that subsidize housing. Uh, and so the types of notices that I would draft for a housing authority always looked very different. Uh, in which and were more complex than houses that I might or uh, notices that I might draft uh, for a just a regular uh, private uh, landlord. Uh, but the notices now that the, the law sort of incorporated that federal standard or that federal notion uh, that the notices have to be very specific. They have to be drafted with specificity. They have to state the reasons for uh, why the tenancy is being terminated, the rental provisions that are being relied upon, uh, uh, the facts that support it, who, what, when, where, why. Uh, so, you know, very simple notices that maybe used to be about a half page, uh, you know, are, are now ballooning into uh, really, you know, two, three, four, five page documents uh, to really cover uh, what's required by the law, depending upon the particular facts of the situation that you have going on. So uh, it's, again, another reason where um, that uh, ounce of prevention is worth more than the pound of cure uh, that Stefan mentioned, uh, which 
my parents told me that too. Uh, so <laughs> uh, uh, that's, um, it really is. You, you, you really want to do it once and you want to do it right the first time through. And, uh, um, and even at, even at that, I, I would note too that uh, I, you know, there's new, there's new legislation in the works for this year as well. So everything that we're telling you here, yeah, could change. Tonight, uh, you know, stay tuned for uh, uh, part two come later uh, after uh, July 1st when the, when the laws become, or when the session laws become law. So, um, but yes, this is um, uh, basically to end a rental agreement. Uh, they're, they're very, well-defined avenues within the law and you got to stay within those lanes and you can't deviate from those lanes and you got to do everything that's required and um and you're really at a disadvantage if you especially at the start of it uh if you don't have a lawyer uh helping you out um i should i should mention um we're again we're talking about month to month land so these these are month. These are reasons to end a month to month that have changed. Um, if you want to end a lease that is um, still, like, say, you sign a one year lease and you're in month nine of that one year lease, that twelve month lease, and you want to end it early, you need to talk to a lawyer because in most cases you can't, and you, you know, the lawyer needs to look at the lease, look at the law, and tell you if you can do that at all. So this this four cost stuff does not necessarily give you an excuse to end a lease during the specific term of that lease before it goes to month to month. These are only for leases that are now month to month. So it's important to keep these distinctions in mind. And this is something a lawyer can help you do. You can go to a lawyer and say, this is where I am in the lease. This is the lease. What can I do? And your lawyer will be able to look at the law and look at your lease and look at your situation and tell you what options there are available. Um, so again, there are even distinctions as to when these four cause rules apply and these four cause rules are not designed. Our legislature has been, our state uh, legislatures have been specific in saying that it's not designed to give you a reason to get out of a lease that is still in process. So if you remember that 12 month lease, if you want to do a, um, to get out of a, get out of that 12 month lease in month nine, the reasons listed here may not get you out of that lease. You need to talk to a lawyer who can tell you whether or not um, you have a reason to get out of that lease early. Um, so keep that in mind too. Uh, sorry that the, it's uh, so many uh, caveats and go talk to a lawyer, but the law has changed. And we want, we want you to be successful in achieving your goals um, and not get caught by some of these uh, details. And the only way to ensure that is to, to advise you to, get specific advice. Um, I think, and correct me if I'm wrong, gentlemen, but I do think that you can still reach a move out agreement with your tenants. Um, uh, we used to call those cash for keys uh, in some cases, but I think the law does allow you to make an offer for your tenants to move out early. Say, I'll give you 500 bucks towards your next place if you give me the keys by the end of the month. Um, you wanna make sure it's in writing and you wanna, I mean, the law is a little unclear to me as to whether you can do it with less than 60 days or not when you're in month to month of land, but to be safe, you want to give your tenants at least 60 days to move out if you're going to do an early move out agreement, a uh, cash for keys style move out deal. And, you know, it, I've heard um, and seen in some cases that it's a more efficient way to, um, to resolve issues with tenants than it is to go to the court. Um, so those are my understanding. And again, gentlemen, correct me if I'm wrong, um, but those are, that's still an option. If you've done that in the past, the only thing you want to make sure you do is give the tenants at least 60 days to move out and make sure your agreement is in a writing that both of you guys or all you guys sign. Yeah, I, I would, I, I believe that, you know, landlords and tenants, uh, the law hasn't changed or necessarily prohibited landlords and tenants from reaching mutual uh, agreements that are, are beneficial to both the landlord and the tenant and doesn't necessarily have to be uh, you know cash for keys any consideration will do there may be some other considerations that uh, that would support an agreement uh, in you know work in other scenarios uh, the one area where the law did change is it, it did create some um, 
restrictions on uh, reaching these types of agreements where, um, you know, if they're, if they're breached, uh, that uh, would waive some certain statutory rights and protections for tenants that they would, that they would otherwise have, um, where they might be able to assert a defense or um, a, under a, you know, under an unlawful detainer that might be brought to enforce the agreement. And so, uh, again, the, what I generally advise my clients is, you know, um, if they, you know, reach, you know, kind of reach some terms with the with the tenant, uh, then come back to me, let me know what those are. And, and you know, I've, I've got, I've done a number of these, we can put one together real quick, it's not going to be real expensive for you. Uh, it'll, you know, it, you know, it'll do what it needs to do for you. Um, you'll, you know, and uh, that way you have some assurance that it's meeting the requirements, uh, meeting the requirements of the law. And if it's not, you know, the part, one of the parties defaults uh, or land, uh, tenant defaults, um, you can have some confidence that, uh, you know, you can take it into court and your agreement will be upheld. So, <clears throat> yeah. It's uh, it's one thing to have a to have a contract. It's another thing to make it uh, make sure it's enforceable. And what John is saying is, um, before you sign the agreement, before you you put the uh, pen to paper and put your John Hancock on there, just make sure a lawyer looks it over, and uh, make sure that uh, the court will actually stand behind it and enforce it. Because um, not all contracts are enforceable. Um, not everything. Just be, not everything that you put down in writing, a judge will say is um, something that they can hold the other side to uh, make them follow. Um, so that's a good, that's a really good point. And, and um, I, would, I would say too that uh, while, while not all contracts are enforceable, there's also, <laughs> there's no, also no such thing as a watertight agreement. Uh, as long as you have uh, sharp people like my colleagues here, uh, uh, they can they can find uh, they can find errors or, or arguments to be made, but uh, the idea is that uh, generally speaking, uh, you know, agreements that are reviewed by legal counsel uh, place place their clients in a better position than if the clients try to draft out their own agreement uh, on the back of a napkin in the driveway. Yeah, definitely. Um, we're we're to the end for those of you that made it here. Um, the key takeaways, these are going to be really brief. They're not going to be specific. Um, be reasonable. That's really what the law is trying to ask you to do. I know all of you listening right now are reasonable people. I know your tenants are usually pretty reasonable. Um, and the law wants to encourage you to communicate, to negotiate, and to try to resolve the issue before you go to court. Um, that's why we have right to counsel. That's why we have the mediation. Um, that's why the law kind of doesn't touch the kind of, as you know, move out agreements that we were just talking about. They want you to be reasonable and to work together to solve your problems with your tenants. Um, and it's a, it's definitely, you know, it's definitely, a, it's never a bad thing to, uh, to try to settle a, a dispute and be reasonable in doing it. The other thing that I think you need to make sure you do, uh, we were talking about notices. We were talking about uh, the details that are required in the law. Keep written records. Uh, don't try not to um, try not to to to. to um, I know I have a colleague who recommends that um, you don't you don't text your clients um, or your your tenants. Uh, that's up to you. But whatever you do, try to make sure that you do things in a way that lets you have a written record of what you're doing. Um, whether that's screenshots from a text, whether that is um, you know emails, whether those are letters. Or, and uh, whether they're formal notices that you've talked with an attorney to help write up and prepare so that you're, you're squared away and meeting the requirements of the law if you need to rely on it, you want to make sure that you do as much as you can in writing. The big thing from the, these new laws is that they have made being a landlord a more paper record intensive uh, job, and it doesn't hurt to have it in writing. Um, so keep written records. I know I've said it a bazillion times in a million different ways. Use a written lease. Um, uh, oral leases, um, you know, between you and your cousin are great until your cousin doesn't want to move out and you want them to. So, um, 
you know, using a written lease gives you additional protections under the law. It's also good for your cousin um, in some ways, because if there's a disagreement, all of you can just look at the lease and consult an attorney to see how the law applies to your lease. As we discussed, there are some benefits to using a written lease and making sure that your lease is up to date. And it's a, a much cheaper way to make sure that you don't have, or maybe try to avoid some problems down the road uh, by making sure that you talk to a lawyer and that you're making sure that your written lease is up to date with the current laws. Um, renew your lease annually. Uh, again, one way to, uh, to avoid going to month to month land is to just have your tenant sign a new lease at the end of the old one um, or 60 days before the old one ends. Uh, if you like your tenants and you want them there for another year, you're guaranteed in many cases to have a full year of rent payments, um, assuming they're good tenants and they're guaranteed a place to stay for the next year. And uh, you get all the benefits of um, the law that go along with renewing a lease annually. Again, there are some downsides. If you have questions about the downsides, talk to your lawyer about them uh, and about your specific case, but a, a good thing, the law seems to want you to re uh, renew your lease annually, and that's why they're giving you some benefits that your lawyer can describe to you. Uh, and finally, if you have questions, call a lawyer. Um, we're here to help. Uh, the senior partner at this firm says that none of the, no lawyer became a lawyer um, without some desire to help people. I've had the privilege of working on a couple different committees with, um, with Zach and John. We've worked on cases together. Um, they're great people, they're hard workers, uh, they're smart, and they, they want to help you. And every lawyer who you ever have in your life most likely wants to help you. So if you have questions, get specific advice for your case, call a lawyer, and do it in private. Don't do it in a public setting. Um, like, uh, don't ask questions of a, of a lawyer over a Facebook Live or in the comments of a Facebook post. Um, with that, thank you. Our, um, I don't know if we should answer questions with that, that disclaimer we just gave, but um, you know, this is some information uh, for us and our, our respective law firms if you wanna reach out. Um, there are other law firms in town that can help you. Um, and lawyers in, uh, in Washington, as long as somebody's licensed to practice in Washington, they can help uh, clients in any county within the state. So a lawyer from Benton Franklin County, uh, Clickitat, uh, Kittitas can help you in Yakima County too. So if you, you're having trouble finding a lawyer here, um, don't be afraid to call out of town or even out of county. Um, if you are a low or income landlord, maybe you're retired and you're using your properties for rental income, uh, in some cases, you may be eligible for assistance through the Yakima County Volunteer Attorney Services Program. Um, again, they are Yakima County Volunteer Attorney Services. That's the name, I'll say it again. Yakima County Volunteer Attorney Services. Their website is yakimavas.org, I believe. Is that, is that correct? Am I recalling that accurately? Yep, Quinn is telling us that we got it right. Okay, um, I know we've been here for quite some time. Uh, if there are no questions or anything like that that we can take a stab at, um, thank you for being here with us. John and Zach, do you have any closing thoughts or comments? I'd certainly say all the accolades that uh, Stefan bestowed upon us certainly apply to him as well. So uh, do look him up and um, yeah, I, 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 we're really looking forward to this going viral and reaching 11 million followers. And uh, speak for uh, yourself on that one. And uh, uh, you know, taking this to a new professional level. Uh, you know, each and every time the new laws come out. So, uh, thanks for everyone that's listening, and um, we'll take it uh, that no questions means we just did an excellent job presenting. So. Thanks to everyone in the metaverse who's watched this and we hope you find it helpful. Um, Zach, anything else? Uh, just echo everything you guys said. Thank, thank you, um, all of you guys. All right, take care y'all. Thank you everyone.